What elements are metals? Metals are elements that easily conduct electricity. There are a number of sets of metals in the periodic table. Instead of just listing the metallic elements. Let's take a look at those sets one at a time in the next few questions. What is a carbon ligand? A carbon is a molecule that contains a carbon atom with two bonds and two unpaired valence electrons. This leaves the carbon atom neutral in terms of formal charge, C atoms and molecules. But still typically much more reactive than a typical carbon atom with four bonds. Carbons are often found coordinated to metal centers in organometallic complexes. These carbon ligands are less reactive than a free carbon species. And actually you might be surprised to learn that organometallic carbon complexes aren't always prepared from the reactions of free carbon S with metal centers. As an organometallic ligand, a carbon may be either electrophilic or nucleophilic at the carbon atom. See organic chemistry. Carbon ligands that are electrophilic at carbon are termed Fischer carbon S. And those that are nucleophilic at carbon are called Schrock carbon S. A third class of particularly unreactive carbon ligands are termed persistent, or Arduengo, carbon S. Does reaction stoichiometry also apply to electron transfers? Yes, for just the same reasons it applies to chemical reactions. The conservation of matter tells us that we must have the same amount of stuff. Before and after a reaction has taken place, so the number of electrons on each side of a chemical reaction equation need to be balanced for the equation to be accurate. What is an addition reaction? In an addition reaction, two or more molecules combine to make one molecule. This is different than the substitution reactions we have been looking at. Where two molecules combine to make two different molecules. The addition of an acid to an alkene is the simplest example. Here. An acid protonates a carbon-carbon double bond. The carbocation that is formed will be the more substituted one of the possible products that could form. The conjugate base of the acid then reacts with this carbocation. What are the lanthanides and actinides? The actinides and lanthanides make up the F block of the periodic table. These two rows are frequently separated from the main table. But that's just so the periodic table isn't so wide on a piece of paper, seriously.
Many of these elements have radioactive isotopes, but the rate at which they decay can vary immensely. For example, 238U has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. But 234Pa has a half-life of only 72 seconds. Why do organometallic complexes make good catalysts? Catalysts, by definition, provide a lower energy route to the product. Organometallic complexes react with organic molecules in ways that are very different than how organic molecules react with themselves. At the most basic level, this is because transition metals have d orbitals that are involved in making and breaking chemical bonds with additional orbitals that are of different symmetry than the sand p orbitals that are available to elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Organometallic complexes can accomplish feats that are just impossible, forbidden, for other elements. Is melting a chemical reaction? No, melting is not a chemical reaction. Melting is a change between phases of matter. And it does not involve the breaking or formation of any new chemical bonds. As the temperature increases to cause a substance to melt. The arrangement of the molecules in the solid slash liquid changes, but no chemical reaction takes place. The same is true for liquid to gas phase changes as well as for the reverse processes. Freezing and condensing. What is a band gap? The band gap for a material is the difference in energy between the valence band and the conduction band. This number tells you how good of a conductor a material is. The smaller the band gap, or the less energy, it takes to promote an electron from the filled to the empty orbitals. The better the material can conduct electrons. What is a polydentate ligand? A polydentate ligand is a ligand that coordinates to a metal center via two or more atoms, forming two or more bonds. This resulting complex is known as a chelate complex. What is crystallography? Crystallography is the study of the arrangement of the atoms in a solid material. Today, this term generally refers to methods that rely on the patterns of photons. Commonly, X-rays, neutrons, or electrons that are diffracted after impacting a sample. The patterns of the diffracted radiation or particles can be interpreted to determine the structure inside the crystal.
the interpretation of the diffraction patterns to yield a chemical structure is by no means a simple task. But crystallographers have been doing this for a long time and it has become a commonplace technique. Crystallographic methods have been used for decades to study the structures of inorganic solids and organometallic complexes. We point out that, while crystallographic methods are commonly used to study inorganic compounds, they have also frequently been applied for studying other types of molecules as well, including biomolecules. While it can often be difficult to obtain a crystalline sample of a biomolecule, such as a protein, crystallography can be extremely useful in deducing protein structures. What is the 18 electron rule? Earlier we talked about the octet rule. Which says that elements like carbon and oxygen are most stable when they have 8 valence electrons. For transition metals, as we've mentioned, the d orbitals start to become important. So 8 electrons just aren't enough anymore. Since there are 5 d orbitals, we need an additional 10 electrons to fill the valence shell. And 8 plus 10 equals 18, hence the 18 electron rule for transition metals. What is the hapticity of an organometallic ligand? The hapticity of an organometallic ligand is a pretty simple concept it just tells how many atoms from a given ligand are coordinated to the metal center. This is typically denoted in chemistry literature with the Greek letter ETA. Can reactions take place in gas, liquid, and solid phases? Absolutely. By molecular, two species, reactions taking place in the gas phase and in. Solutions are quite similar in that they involve random diffusion of reactant molecules until they collide. At which point a reaction may take place. For reactions involving solids, the surface of a solid is often reacting with another species. That is present at the interface between the solid and a gas or liquid with which it is in contact. An example would be your car rusting to form oxides. What is a pyrophoric reagent? Pyrophoric reagents are substances that will ignite spontaneously when exposed to air. Very often, this is due to a reaction with the water in the air. Thus pyrophoric reagents should be used only under inert atmospheres. Such as in a glove box filled with an inert gas such as argon or nitrogen. Often, pyrophorics will be sold as solutions already dissolved in a solvent so that they do not tend to create fires so easily. Some of the more mild pyrophoric substances can be handled in the air. 
but caution needs to be exercised to flush air out of the container before storing them for an extended period of time. They also must be disposed of with caution, or they might accidentally set the waste bucket on fire. Perhaps not surprisingly, pyrophoric materials can be useful for starting fires in a controlled manner. Pyrophoric materials are present in the spark generating mechanisms in lighters and some firearms. How does one determine the oxidation state of an organometallic complex? There are a few ways to approach this problem, and, of course, every chemist thinks the way they use is the most correct. But let's look at what is hopefully the simplest way to think about this. We're going to only talk about complexes with metal carbon bonds and no other types of ligands. If you're curious enough to want to know how nitroxide binds a transition metal, Chances are you have an inorganic chemistry textbook at home anyway. Okay, let's look at tetra, methyl, zirconium, which has no net charge. In this counting technique, all of the electrons in the metal carbon bonds are placed on the carbon atoms. So we get four methyl anions and one zirconium ion. Since this complex has no net charge, the zirconium center must balance out the net four negative charges from the methyl groups. Zirconium must be in the plus four oxidation state. Easy. Right? One more example, K3Fe, Cn, 6 or potassium hexacyanoferrate. We again move the electrons in the metal carbon bonds to the carbon groups. Making six cyanide ions, Cn, an iron ion, and three potassium ions. We have six negative charges, six Cn, and three positive charges, three K and ions. So to balance out the charges, the iron center must be in the plus 3 oxidation state. ZrMe4 4 Me1 plus Zr4 plus K3 Fe, Cn, 6 3 K1 plus plus 6 Cn1 plus Fe3 plus it's important to remember that when we count electrons in this way, we're doing only that counting. Don't get the idea that all of these metal carbon bonds are the same or that they're all ionic bonds this is just for electron bookkeeping. Who were Diels and Alder? The Diels-Alder reaction, like many reactions in organic chemistry, is named after the chemists who discovered it in this case Otto Paul Hermann Diels, 1876-1954, and Kurt Alder, 1902-1958. Kurt Alder was actually Diels' student at the University of Kiel. And Alder was awarded a PhD in 1926. Alder and his advisor Diels jointly received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1950. What is a carbon-hydrogen bond activation reaction? Carbon-hydrogen activation reactions are very much what the name 
would imply they break typically unreactive carbon-hydrogen bonds. Considering the prevalence of carbon-hydrogen bonds in organic compounds. This is another extremely important type of reaction to be able to carry out both effectively and with selectivity. Successful examples of carbon-hydrogen bond activation reactions have only come about relatively recently. With the first genuine example reported CA. 1965, and organometallic reagents have played a key. Role in the development of carbon-hydrogen bond reactions. What is a carbon-hydrogen bond activation reaction? Carbon-hydrogen activation reactions are very much what the name would imply they break typically unreactive carbon-hydrogen bonds. Considering the prevalence of carbon-hydrogen bonds in organic compounds. This is another extremely important type of reaction to be able to carry out both effectively and with selectivity. Successful examples of carbon-hydrogen bond activation reactions have only come about relatively recently. With the first genuine example reported CA. 1965, and organometallic reagents have played a key. Role in the development of carbon-hydrogen bond reactions. What is the Grignard reaction? The Grignard reaction is one of the most well-known and powerful reactions in organometallic synthesis. Primarily due to its ability to readily form new carbon-carbon bonds. In this reaction, a Grignard reagent reacts by adding to a carbonyl functional group of an aldehyde or ketone and forms a new carbon-carbon bond at the carbonyl carbon. Grignard reagents, which are organometallic species that carry out the Grignard reaction, are typically formed by adding magnesium metal to an alkyl or aryl halide, R1Br in the scheme below. The discovery of this important reaction was awarded with a Nobel Prize in 1912, and the reaction is actually also named after the French chemist François-Auguste Victor Grignard, who discovered it. What is the Grignard reaction? The Grignard reaction is one of the most well-known and powerful reactions in organometallic synthesis. Primarily due to its ability to readily form new carbon-carbon bonds. In this reaction, a Grignard reagent reacts by adding to a carbonyl functional group of an aldehyde or ketone and forms a new carbon-carbon bond at the carbonyl carbon. Grignard reagents, which are organometallic species that carry out the Grignard reaction, are typically formed by adding magnesium metal to an alkyl or aryl halide, R1Br in the scheme below. The discovery of this important reaction was awarded with a Nobel Prize in 1912, and the reaction is actually also named after the French chemist François-Auguste Victor Grignard, who discovered it.
Do reactions always take place at the metal center of an organometallic complex? Not always. Reactions can also take place at the ligands of a complex. For example, a nucleophile can add to an alkene ligand while it is coordinated to a metal center. Do reactions always take place at the metal center of an organometallic complex? Not always. Reactions can also take place at the ligands of a complex. For example, a nucleophile can add to an alkene ligand while it is coordinated to a metal center. What is cisplatin, and how does it help to fight cancer? Cisplatin is a platinum-based compound, see structure below, that reacts with DNA causing it to cross-slink. Eventually leading to programmed cell death, also known as apoptosis. Cisplatin was the first in a class of platinum-containing anti-cancer drugs. It has been used to fight several types of cancer and is particularly effective against testicular cancer. What is cisplatin, and how does it help to fight cancer? Cisplatin is a platinum-based compound, see structure below, that reacts with DNA causing it to cross-slink. Eventually leading to programmed cell death, also known as apoptosis. Cisplatin was the first in a class of platinum-containing anti-cancer drugs. It has been used to fight several types of cancer and is particularly effective against testicular cancer. What is the valence shell electron pair repulsion model? The valence shell electron pair repulsion model, V-spare, is used to predict the bonding geometry about a central atom based on a set of rules that predicts the repulsive forces between the electrons in chemical bonds and in lone pairs. In this model, two factors are used to predict the bonding geometry. The steric number and the number of lone pairs of non-bonding electrons. The steric number is defined as the number of atoms bonded to the central atom plus the number of lone pairs of non-bonding electrons. Based on these two numbers, the table below predicts the bonding geometry that will be observed about a central atom. It should be noted that this is just a predictive model, and it will not be correct 100% of the time. What is the valence shell electron pair repulsion model? The valence shell electron pair repulsion model, V-spare, 
is used to predict the bonding geometry about a central atom based on a set of rules that predicts the repulsive forces between the electrons in chemical bonds and in lone pairs. In this model, two factors are used to predict the bonding geometry. The steric number and the number of lone pairs of non-bonding electrons. The steric number is defined as the number of atoms bonded to the central atom plus the number of lone pairs of non-bonding electrons. Based on these two numbers, the table below predicts the bonding geometry that will be observed about a central atom. It should be noted that this is just a predictive model, and it will not be correct 100% of the time. What is group theory and how is it useful in chemistry? Group theory, in the chemistry sense, involves making use of the symmetry of a molecule to better understand its physical properties. By examining the symmetry properties of a molecule, it can be placed into a point group that describes the symmetry operations. Rotations of reflections, that characterize the molecule symmetry. Group theory allows chemists to understand an impressive number of molecular properties. Including the spacing of energy levels of the orbitals in a molecule, the symmetry of the molecular orbitals. The types of transitions that can occur, like vibrational and electronic excitations. And what the delocalized vibrational motions of a molecule look like. It is very impressive that symmetry can tell us so much. About molecules without the need for any complex calculations. What is group theory and how is it useful in chemistry? Group theory, in the chemistry sense, involves making use of the symmetry of a molecule to better understand its physical properties. By examining the symmetry properties of a molecule, it can be placed into a point group that describes the symmetry operations. Rotations of reflections, that characterize the molecule symmetry. Group theory allows chemists to understand an impressive number of molecular properties. Including the spacing of energy levels of the orbitals in a molecule, the symmetry of the molecular orbitals. The types of transitions that can occur, like vibrational and electronic excitations. And what the delocalized vibrational motions of a molecule look like. It is very impressive that symmetry can tell us so much. About molecules without the need for any complex calculations. What are hard and soft Lewis acids and bases? The words hard and soft are commonly used to describe two broad classes of Lewis acids and bases, see chemical reactions. Hard acids and bases typically have small atomic or ionic radii, high oxidation states, 
high electronegativity, for bases, and are not very polarizable. Soft acids and bases tend to be the opposite in that they have relatively large atomic or ionic, radii, low oxidation states, low electronegativity, and are highly polarizable. As it turns out, hard acids tend to react more rapidly and form stronger bonds with hard bases. And the same is true for soft acids paired with soft bases. This pattern is what makes the theory of hard and soft acids and bases useful for predicting and understanding reactivity in inorganic complexes. What are hard and soft Lewis acids and bases? The words hard and soft are commonly used to describe two broad classes of Lewis acids and bases, see chemical reactions. Hard acids and bases typically have small atomic, or ionic, radii, high oxidation states, high electronegativity, for bases, and are not very polarizable. Soft acids and bases tend to be the opposite in that they have relatively large atomic or ionic, radii, low oxidation states, low electronegativity, and are highly polarizable. As it turns out, hard acids tend to react more rapidly and form stronger bonds with hard bases. And the same is true for soft acids paired with soft bases. This pattern is what makes the theory of hard and soft acids and bases useful for predicting and understanding reactivity in inorganic complexes. What happens when you add sodium metal to water? Sodium metal reacting with water can produce a violent response. Sodium and water react according to the equation, 2Na, S, plus 2H2O, L. 2NaOH, AQ, plus H2, G, plus heat as you can see, this reaction produces heat. And it turns out that the amount of heat produced can be pretty substantial. The heat can even cause the hydrogen gas, produced in the reaction, to ignite. Thus reacting according to this equation, H2, G, plus O2, G, H2O, G. Plus heat the heat produced by both of these reactions can even cause any currently unreacted sodium metal to also ignite and burn according to the equation. Na, S, plus O2, G, Na2O2, S, from these reactions. It is probably clear that the reaction of sodium with water can produce quite a lot of heat. What happens when you add sodium metal to water? Sodium metal reacting with water can produce a violent response. Sodium and water react according to the equation, 2Na, S, plus 2H2O, L. 2NaOH, AQ, plus H2, G, plus heat as you can see, this reaction produces heat. 
and it turns out that the amount of heat produced can be pretty substantial. The heat can even cause the hydrogen gas, produced in the reaction, to ignite. Thus reacting according to this equation, H2, G, plus O2, G, H2O, G. Plus heat the heat produced by both of these reactions can even cause any currently unreacted sodium metal to also ignite and burn according to the equation. Na, S, plus O2, G, Na2O2, S, from these reactions. It is probably clear that the reaction of sodium with water can produce quite a lot of heat. What is electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy? Electron paramagnetic resonance EPR, spectroscopy, also known as electron spin resonance. ESR, spectroscopy, is a method used to probe unpaired electrons in a molecule. This method is fairly similar to nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR, see the modern chemical lab. But it involves exciting electronic spin states instead of nuclear ones. One downside to this technique, relative to NMR, is that the majority of molecules do not contain unpaired electrons and thus cannot be studied using EPR. On the other hand, the lack of interfering signals from most solvents and other molecules can very often be an advantage for the same reason. What is electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy? Electron paramagnetic resonance, EPR, spectroscopy, also known as electron spin resonance. ESR, spectroscopy, is a method used to probe unpaired electrons in a molecule. This method is fairly similar to nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR, see the modern chemical lab but it involves exciting electronic spin states instead of nuclear ones. One downside to this technique, relative to NMR, is that the majority of molecules do not contain unpaired electrons and thus cannot be studied using EPR. On the other hand, the lack of interfering signals from most solvents and other molecules can very often be an advantage for the same reason. How is inorganic chemistry relevant to biological chemistry? Because metals are important to many biological processes. In the active sites of enzymes, see biochemistry, where the important chemical reactions take place. Metal centers are frequently crucial to the catalytic bond forming and bond breaking events. Metals are also important for maintaining gradients in ion concentrations. Allowing muscles to move, and a variety of other biological processes. Bioinorganic chemistry is thus a huge field. And these two topics are often taught in conjunction with one another.
How is inorganic chemistry relevant to biological chemistry? Because metals are important to many biological processes. In the active sites of enzymes, see biochemistry, where the important chemical reactions take place. Metal centers are frequently crucial to the catalytic bond forming and bond breaking events. Metals are also important for maintaining gradients in ion concentrations. Allowing muscles to move, and a variety of other biological processes. Bioinorganic chemistry is thus a huge field. And these two topics are often taught in conjunction with one another. Why do metals make for such effective active sites in enzyme catalysis? Metals are crucial components in enzymatic catalysis for largely the same reasons that organometallic complexes make good catalysts. These include the fact that many metal centers can complex to a variety of substrates, undergo facile changes in oxidation state, and provide good electron donors or acceptors. These characteristics can, and often do, work together to accomplish some remarkable chemical feats. Why do metals make for such effective active sites in enzyme catalysis? Metals are crucial components in enzymatic catalysis for largely the same reasons that organometallic complexes make good catalysts. These include the fact that many metal centers can complex to a variety of substrates, undergo facile changes in oxidation state, and provide good electron donors or acceptors. These characteristics can, and often do, work together to accomplish some remarkable chemical feats. What are MRI contrast agents and what are they used for in medicine? Magnetic Resonance Imaging MRI, see the Modern Chemical Lab. Contrast agents are used to make tissues and other structures inside the body easier to view in an MRI scan. Many of these contrast agents are based on gadolinium with various ligands attached. The contrast agents are injected or ingested into the body and they function by changing the relaxation time of the atoms observed in an MRI scan. The overall result is that these complexes improve the ability of MRI to see what is going on in your body. What are MRI contrast agents and what are they used for in medicine? Magnetic Resonance Imaging, MRI, see the Modern Chemical Lab. Contrast agents are used to make tissues and other structures inside the body easier to view in an MRI scan. Many of these contrast agents are based on gadolinium with various ligands attached. The contrast agents are injected or ingested into the body. 
and they function by changing the relaxation time of the atoms observed in an MRI scan. The overall result is that these complexes improve the ability of MRI to see what is going on in your body. What is the auto-ignition temperature of a substance? The auto-ignition temperature is similar to the flash point. Except that it does not require an ignition source to begin or to continue burning. Above the auto-ignition temperature, the vapor will start to burn and continue to burn, even in the absence of any ignition source. What makes metals good conductors? An electrical current is the movement of electrons. So a conductive material allows the free movement of electrons. Metals are good conductors of electricity because of their electronic structure. There are basically two big groups of orbitals in metals the valence band and the conduction band. The valence band is the group of orbitals that are normally filled in a metal. While the conduction band is empty. These are called bands because they are made up of sets of closely spaced energy levels. Metals, and other good conductors of electricity, can have very small or no band gaps at all. Semiconductors have small band gaps. And electrons can be promoted from the valence band to the conduction band either by heat or light. Insulators, materials that do not conduct electricity, have large band gaps. What is the structure of diamond? Diamond has a repeating structure of carbon atoms in which all the atoms are bonded to four others in a tetrahedral geometry. It's easiest to see if we first look at the structure of cyclohexane. A ring, cyclo, of six carbon atoms, hex, with no double bonds, on a if we repeat the structure of cyclohexane over and over, we arrive at the structure for diamond. What is a carbon-hydrogen bond activation reaction? Carbon-hydrogen activation reactions are very much what the name would imply they break typically unreactive carbon-hydrogen bonds. Considering the prevalence of carbon-hydrogen bonds in organic compounds, this is another extremely important type of reaction to be able to carry out both effectively and with selectivity. Successful examples of carbon-hydrogen bond activation reactions have only come about relatively recently. With the first genuine example reported ca. 1965, and organometallic reagents have played a key role in the development of carbon-hydrogen bond reactions. What is the Grignard reaction?
the Grignard reaction is one of the most well-known and powerful reactions in organometallic synthesis. Primarily due to its ability to readily form new carbon-carbon bonds. In this reaction, a Grignard reagent reacts by adding to a carbonyl functional group of an aldehyde or ketone and forms a new carbon-carbon bond at the carbonyl carbon. Grignard reagents, which are organometallic species that carry out the Grignard reaction, are typically formed by adding magnesium metal to an alkyl or aryl halide, R1Br in the scheme below. The discovery of this important reaction was awarded with a Nobel Prize in 1912, and the reaction is actually also named after the French chemist François-Auguste Victor Grignard, who discovered it. Can more than one packing arrangement exist for a given chemical molecule? Yes this is referred to as polymorphism, and examples are known for most types of crystalline materials organic and inorganic molecules, polymers, and metals. The way in which molecules pack in the solid state can actually alter some of its properties. Some pharmaceutically active molecules have more than one solid state structure, or polymorphs. Sometimes certain polymorphs of drugs can be more useful. For example, a specific arrangement could be more soluble, making it more active in the human body. A second polymorph of aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid, was discovered in 2005, but it's only stable at minus 180 degrees Celsius. What happens when you add sodium metal to water? Sodium metal reacting with water can produce a violent response. Sodium and water react according to the equation, 2Na, S, plus 2H2O, L. 2NaOH, AQ, plus H2, G, plus heat as you can see, this reaction produces heat. And it turns out that the amount of heat produced can be pretty substantial. The heat can even cause the hydrogen gas, produced in the reaction, to ignite. Thus reacting according to this equation, H2, G, plus O2, G, H2O, G. Plus heat the heat produced by both of these reactions can even cause any currently unreacted sodium metal to also ignite and burn according to the equation. Na, S, plus O2, G, Na2O2, S, from these reactions. It is probably clear that the reaction of sodium with water can produce quite a lot of heat. What is electron paramagnetic resonance spectroscopy? Electron paramagnetic resonance EPR, spectroscopy, also known as electron spin resonance. ESR, spectroscopy, is a method used to probe unpaired electrons in a molecule. This method is fairly similar to nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR, see the modern chemical lab. 
but it involves exciting electronic spin states instead of nuclear ones. One downside to this technique, relative to NMR, is that the majority of molecules do not contain unpaired electrons and thus cannot be studied using EPR. On the other hand, the lack of interfering signals from most solvents and other molecules can very often be an advantage for the same reason. What is the difference between paramagnetic and diamagnetic complexes? In chemistry, atoms, or molecules that have at least one unpaired electron. So there is a net spin to the molecule, are known as paramagnetic. If all electrons are paired, chemists refer to the compound as diamagnetic. When a magnetic field is applied a paramagnetic substance will be attracted to the field. While diamagnetic molecules will be repelled from the field. What is group theory and how is it useful in chemistry? Group theory, in the chemistry sense, involves making use of the symmetry of a molecule to better understand its physical properties. By examining the symmetry properties of a molecule, it can be placed into a point group that describes the symmetry operations. Rotations of reflections, that characterize the molecule symmetry. Group theory allows chemists to understand an impressive number of molecular properties, including the spacing of energy levels of the orbitals in a molecule, the symmetry of the molecular orbitals, the types of transitions that can occur, like vibrational and electronic excitations, and what the delocalized vibrational motions of a molecule look like. It is very impressive that symmetry can tell us so much about molecules without the need for any complex calculations. What are hydrocarbons, and how many different ones are there? Hydrocarbons, as you might have figured out from the name, are molecules that contain only hydrogen and carbon atoms. There are literally an infinite number of ways to arrange these two elements together. Especially if you include polymers, see polymer chemistry. Hydrocarbons are important molecules. Different sizes and types of hydrocarbons are known as natural gas. Gasoline, waxes, like candles, and plastics. Why do metals make for such effective active sites in enzyme catalysis? Metals are crucial components in enzymatic catalysis for largely the same reasons that organometallic complexes make good catalysts. These include the fact that many metal centers can complex to a variety of substrates. 
undergo facil changes in oxidation state, and provide good electron donors or acceptors. These characteristics can, and often do, work together to accomplish some remarkable chemical feats. Are all crystal lattices cubic? In other words, are all the three axes of the unit cell always the same length? No. In fact, cubic is only one of the seven crystal systems. These systems are based on the lengths and angles of the unit cell. The cubic group has three sides of equal length, and all the internal angles are 90 degrees. If one side is longer, we get a tetragonal lattice. If all three sides are different lengths, the lattice system is called orthorhombic. If one angle is not 90 degrees, it's monoclinic. If the angles are all equal but they're not 90 degrees, it's a rhombohedral lattice. If the angles are all different and not 90 degrees, the lattice is triclinic. Yes, you're right, that's only 6. The 7th isn't based on a cube at all. The hexagonal lattice system is, you guessed it, based on a hexagon. Can carbon chains form rings, too? Yes chains of carbon atoms can connect back to themselves, forming rings of atoms. The prefix cyclo is added to the name of the linear carbon chain to indicate that a ring is present, so hexane becomes cyclohexane. The chemistry ring structures can be different than their linear cousins because of the added energy that some rings contain. We know that sp3 hybridized atoms like to form bonds that are separated by 109.5 degrees. The more that a ring forces those bonds to deviate from that ideal angle, the more energy. Called ring strain, that is released when that ring is opened during a chemical reaction. Why are metals attracted to metal? Or why do magnets stick to your fridge? Ferromagnets generate their own magnetic field. This means that other paramagnetic substances will be attracted to ferromagnets. Just like they are attracted to magnetic fields. Most metals are paramagnetic, so magnets stick to your metal fridge. But your fridge itself is not magnetic. Why have chemists devoted so much focus to the chemistry of carbon? Because it's everywhere. Carbon is the fourth most abundant element in the universe, 15th on our planet. And the building blocks of life, DNA, amino acids, all contain many carbon atoms. Many. 
Biologically active molecules and medicines rely on carbon to define their overall shape. What gives rise to magnetism? The type of magnetism you're most familiar with. The kind that keeps magnets on your fridge, is technically known as ferromagnetism. Ferromagnets are permanent magnets they generate their own magnetic field. Ferromagnets have unpaired electrons, so from the information in the previous question we can say that ferromagnets are paramagnetic, not diamagnetic. But ferromagnets have one additional key trait the unpaired electron spins are all aligned in the same direction. Which generates a permanent magnetic field. Let's go through this again from the beginning, electrons have spin, a quantum mechanical property. But we don't need to go that far back, and this spin generates a very, very tiny magnetic field. If all the electrons in a substance are paired, it is diamagnetic. If there are unpaired electrons, the substance is paramagnetic. If there are unpaired electrons and those unpaired electrons are aligned so that there is a net spin for the macroscopic substance, it is a ferromagnetic. Ferromagnets are the magnets you know they stick to your fridge. Are hydrocarbons always straight chains of carbon atoms? No. There could be carbon atoms attached to the linear chains we talked about in the previous question. Let's learn the next step in naming alkanes and have a look. First, we need to define the names of branches, see graphic, next page. Chemists use the same prefixes to indicate the length of the branch. But now the suffix is YL instead of ana. So methane, CH4, when it's a branch off of a chain of carbon atoms, becomes methyl, CH3, ethane, CH3, CH3, becomes ethyl, CH2, CH3, and so on. Next we have to indicate where along the main carbon chain the branch point is. This part is pretty simple just number the carbon atoms and put this number before the name of the branch. So if you had an 8 carbon chain, octane, with a 2 carbon branch, ethyl octane. On the third carbon from the end, it would be called 3 ethyl octane and look like this. There are a lot more rules to naming organic compounds, but that's enough for now. Where do I run into organic chemicals in my life? The food you eat, the clothes you wear, the gasoline in your car, the plastic bags you may, or may not. Get at the grocery store. The list could go on forever. What packing arrangements are possible for a crystal lattice?
There are three basic packing arrangements, which we can describe by again imagining a tiny box. If we place an atom at each of the eight vertices of this box, the arrangement is referred to as simple cubic. If we take a simple cubic unit cell and add an atom to the center of each face, we have a face-centered cubic arrangement. If we instead add an atom to the center of the cube, it's called a body-centered cubic unit cell. There are more possibilities. But these three simple ones described here cover a lot of the crystals that chemists encounter. How is inorganic chemistry relevant to biological chemistry? Because metals are important to many biological processes. In the active sites of enzymes, see biochemistry, where the important chemical reactions take place. Metal centers are frequently crucial to the catalytic bond forming and bond breaking events. Metals are also important for maintaining gradients in ion concentrations. Allowing muscles to move, and a variety of other biological processes. Bioinorganic chemistry is thus a huge field. And these two topics are often taught in conjunction with one another. What are MRI contrast agents and what are they used for in medicine? Magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. See the modern chemical lab. Contrast agents are used to make tissues and other structures inside the body easier to view in an MRI scan. Many of these contrast agents are based on gadolinium with various ligands attached. The contrast agents are injected or ingested into the body and they function by changing the relaxation time of the atoms observed in an MRI scan. The overall result is that these complexes improve the ability of MRI to see what is going on in your body. What is an organic compound? Any molecule, or compound, that contains carbon atoms is referred to as organic. The usage of this term is a bit arbitrary, though, as some forms of carbon, like graphite and diamond. And carbon-containing ions, like formate and carbonate, are not thought of by chemists as organic molecules. What is the valence shell electron pair repulsion model? The valence shell electron pair repulsion model, V spare, is used to predict the bonding geometry about a central atom based on a set of rules that predicts the repulsive forces between the electrons in chemical bonds and in lone pairs. In this model, two factors are used to predict the bonding geometry. The steric number and the number of lone pairs of non-bonding electrons. The steric number is defined as the number of atoms bonded to the 
central atom plus the number of lone pairs of non-bonding electrons. Based on these two numbers, the table below predicts the bonding geometry that will be observed about a central atom. It should be noted that this is just a predictive model, and it will not be correct 100% of the time. How do chemists name so many different hydrocarbons? With a bunch of rules. Let's start with just straight chains of carbon atoms. Here we just need to define how many carbon atoms there are in the molecule. If the molecule doesn't have any double bonds, we use the suffix ana. The prefix indicates how many carbon atoms there are. Most of these prefixes are based on Greek numbers, one is Latin, and a few are just weird. Collectively, these molecules are called alkanes. How many bonds can carbon form? Carbon has four electrons available for bonding with other atoms. When carbon is bonded to four other atoms, they are arranged in a tetrahedral geometry. These two simple bonding rules have important consequences, as we'll see in this chapter. What are hard and soft Lewis acids and bases? The words hard and soft are commonly used to describe two broad classes of Lewis acids and bases, see chemical reactions. Hard acids and bases typically have small atomic, or ionic, Radii, high oxidation states, high electronegativity, for bases, and are not very polarizable. Soft acids and bases tend to be the opposite in that they have relatively large atomic or ionic, radii, low oxidation states, low electronegativity, and are highly polarizable. As it turns out, Hard acids tend to react more rapidly and form stronger bonds with hard bases. And the same is true for soft acids paired with soft bases. This pattern is what makes the theory of hard and soft acids and bases useful for predicting and understanding reactivity in inorganic complexes. What was the first organic chemical ever synthesized in a lab? Plus urea. In 1828 Friedrich Wohler was trying to make ammonium cyanate. NH4CNO, but this salt turned out to be unstable. It reacted to form urea, demonstrating for the first time, arguable according to some, that an organic chemical could be made from inorganic starting materials. What is magnetic levitation?
magnets apply forces on one another, and these forces can be either attractive or repulsive. If they are repulsive, and if the forces balance against the force of gravity in a carefully designed way, then the magnetic forces can be used to make an object levitate. This is put to practical use in high-speed trains, which can hover above the track while moving quickly on a magnetic cushion. What determines the most favorable packing arrangement? Thermodynamics Okay, that's a cop-out answer. Attractive interactions, like van der Waals forces or hydrogen bonding, can play a large role in determining the stability of a crystal lattice. The most stable packing arrangement can also depend on the pressure and temperature at which the crystal forms. What is a crystal lattice? Crystalline solids have regular, repeating arrangements of atoms or molecules. In order to classify these arrangements, chemists use a three-dimensional lattice to encompass the smallest repeat unit. Known as the unit cell, of the crystal structure. There is really a lot of math involved, but we can explain it visually. A unit cell is really just a tiny box containing some atoms or molecules. We draw the edges of this small box so that if you were to line up lots of identical copies of this box in all directions, you would get the structure of the entire crystal lattice. What is the shape of a carbon-carbon double bond? The geometry of the carbon atoms in double bonds is planar. This shape comes from the hybridization of the carbon atom, which is sp2, 1p orbital is not involved in forming single bonds. To get a bonding interaction between these two remaining p orbitals, they have to overlap in space. So in a molecule like ethylene, C2H4, all of the hydrogen atoms are located in the same plane. Do reactions always take place at the metal center of an organometallic complex? Not always. Reactions can also take place at the ligands of a complex. For example, a nucleophile can add to an alkene ligand while it is coordinated to a metal center. Are the north and south poles of the Earth magnetic poles? Without getting too technical on the physics here, it gets way more complicated with a whole planet versus a tiny piece of iron on your fridge yes the north and south poles are magnetic poles but compasses point north 
so what we call the North Pole is actually the South Magnetic Pole and vice versa. So why do opposite ends of magnets attract or repel one another? Remember that real-world magnets are ferromagnetic substances they have a net overall spin. Again this is a quantum mechanical spin, but it's okay to think of it as spin up or down. In a ferromagnet all of these spins are pointing in the same direction. If you put the up ends of a magnet together, they will repel the magnetic fields are pushing in opposite directions. If you put an up end next to a down end, they will attract the magnetic fields are working in the same direction. Just like the electron spins are aligned within the magnet. What is cisplatin? And how does it help to fight cancer? Cisplatin is a platinum-based compound, see structure below, that reacts with DNA causing it to cross-slink. Eventually leading to programmed cell death, also known as apoptosis. Cisplatin was the first in a class of platinum containing anti cancer drugs. It has been used to fight several types of cancer and is particularly effective against testicular cancer. 